let's do one more just to give people a few minutes to get here. Seven sixty three. It's a good section of the hymnal. Seven six three. Shall sound and the horn shall descend. He 
us in our service. We welcome you and thank you again. We'll try out two weeks ago worked. David wants me to talk in the microphone because he tapes the services. We also ask that uh, you might pray for Diane, your wife, who's under the weather today. Sure. Think of her, too. Uh, financial statements for last year are in the back. We thank Sue Crawl once again for putting those together so quickly. Uh, Sue for Super Bowl, we have two more weeks for that. Um, you can put your donations downstairs. And also, uh, next Sunday is the last Sunday of the month, and that's our Mercy Ministry Sunday. Uh, any financial gifts that you would like to give for that will go to our people in need in the neighborhood or our own members. So keep that in your thoughts and prayers. After church, Bible class, we have The Chosen again, the video. I think we're on part four now. And then uh, Dan has something to say. I have something I've been asked to say. <laughs> um, I just noticed a couple new faces in church today. Um, there's a new couple here that just recently moved into the neighborhood, and uh, they're uh, church shopping, so uh, I thought we would just embarrass them a little bit. Um, Pastor and Marlis Schultz, would you please stand up so that we can all see who you are? <laughs> They're all moved into the parsonage next door, and by moved in, that they're living, and by moved in, I mean they're uh, living with boxes everywhere. So, <laughs> um, good luck and God bless as you uh, get set up in your new home. Um, so, uh, just after the service today, uh, be sure to um, introduce yourself and say hi to Pastor Marlis, and we look very much forward to the 7th when uh, um, Pastor Schultz becomes our pastor. So, thank you. Thank you, Dan. We also have the visitor gift uh, bag for you. <laughs> you find this very handy. Kind of like welcome wagon. I like the suspenders too. I'm, I'm in there. <laughs> I want to uh, thank the Schultzes also. They moved themselves. Part of the call was that we would move them at our expense, but they did it all uh, with a U-Haul, and they took two trips, and they were exhausted, and I know they had to stop at a motel on the way back on the second trip, and the church will cover that, too, since they saved us so much money. We really appreciate the effort that you two really knocked yourselves out for that. Um, I want to also thank the uh, members who helped get the parsonage in, in, in uh, in order, and I also like to thank those that came on the two days that we needed to unload the truck. Uh, we had a good turnout. It's a good start. We have to show support to our pastor and his wife, and uh, I'm very excited about this whole thing, believe it or not. I <laughs> think even at 66, it's fun to be excited about something. Uh, the insula insulation, 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 will be two weeks from today, February 7th. At Super Bowl Sunday, but it's at two o'clock, and the service that will be then, and then uh, we will have a luncheon afterwards. It's going to be limited to 100 people because of COVID, so we ask you to register. You can either register by calling the office, or else next week uh, in the bulletin there'll be registration forms. I just want you to know something I found out this morning from Pastor Me. There are over 600 vacancies for pastors in the Missouri Synod. We are so blessed here that after only five and a half months, that Pastor Schultz and his wife have accepted our call. We are so blessed. And then one other thing I wanted to say. Pastor Schultz moved in with a snowblower. Now, I don't know what's going on here. Am I losing my job? Is this part of the thing here? I want to ask John, John uh, Rodwin. You know, you could have called me into the office or something if you'd like to go. But uh, no, 
I told Pastor Schultz if he wants to do any of that sort of stuff, he's welcome. And this morning he was actually out there shoveling the parsonage with a shovel. Uh, but so, uh, and, and one other thing, I know I'm carried on, but Matt Wilkes is like my son. I'm not very direct kids, but that has come through so well for me. I have not been blessed with fix it qualities. And I can do the what I call the grunt labor, but Matt has fixed the snowblower for me recently, and it broke again today, but we were getting through the day. And also, yesterday he was over at the parsonage hanging the closet doors, and that's stuff that I can't do. And I can rely on Matt to do all that stuff. And then there's Dan Rodwin, who does so much here. So I don't want to hear anybody complain about the younger generation. We're in good hands as we get old. So that's my sermon for today. Now let Pastor Bay take over. <laughs> Yes, so it really is my turn. <laughs> oh. All right, I will make a note of that. Bill already told you who I am, but just out of curiosity, some people do wonder about my name. They say, May, and about nine out of ten people ask me, how do you spell that? You know, M-A-E, M-A-Y-S, and so forth. So I just remind Everyone, it's think of March, April. Yeah. You got it. But uh, I am uh, glad to be here today too and rejoice with you on this. It says that it's the third Sunday after the Epiphany of our Lord, but in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Center, too, we often, almost always, recognize Life Sunday. So you're going to be hearing of a verse from Jeremiah where our Lord speaks to him about his life and how precious it is. A lot of you probably have that verse stapled onto your uh, wall, like our uh, youngest son did when he went off to Concordia. Uh, you know, I have plans for you, says God, and he certainly does. So with that, we are ready to begin. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We've had our announcements. We say it.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I guess the secretary stuck these together. Lord, to whom shall we go? We have the words of eternal life. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. Almighty God, we confess our sin to you, our willful separation from you and from your ways of life. By our sin we cause death to reign in our life our relationships, and our world. We repent for all that denies your of our life. We continue to struggle against the very sin we despise. Sin crouches at the door, and we cannot rule over it. In repentance we beg you, O God, repent and turn from your anger, so that we I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Nineveh will be 
believed God. They decided to fast, and everyone, from the most important to the least important, dressed in sackcloth. God saw what they did. He saw that they turned from their wicked ways, so God reconsidered his threat to destroy them, and he didn't do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My soul waits calmly for God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my Savior, my stronghold. I cannot be severely shaken. How long will all of you attack a person? How long will you try to murder him? As though he were an evil or a second chance. They plan to force him out of the time's mission. They are happy to lie. They bless with their mouths, but in their hearts they curse. Wait calmly for God alone, my soul because my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my savior, my stronghold. I cannot be shaken. My salvation and my glory is the God. God is the rock of my strength and my refuge. Trust him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts in his presence. God is our refuge. Glory be to the Father, Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second lesson for the day is from the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning at verse 29. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The time has been shortened. While at last, those who are married should live as those they were not. Those who have eyes filled with tears should live as though they have no sorrow. Those who are happy should live as though there was nothing to be happy about. Those who buy something should live as though they didn't own it. Those who use the things in this world should do so, but not depend on them. It is clear that this world in its present form is passing away. So I don't want you to have any concerns. An unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord that is, about how he can please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about earthly things that is, about how he can please his wife. His attention is divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's things so that she may be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is concerned about earthly things, that is, about how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to restrict you. I am showing you how to live a noble life of devotion to the Lord without being distracted by other things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They immediately left their nets and followed him. 
as Jesus went on a little farther, he saw James and John, sons of Zebedee. They were in a boat preparing their nets to go fishing. He immediately called them, and they left their father Zebedee and the hired men in the boat and followed Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn. Let the world just kind of go in cruise control. 
A person could then go to the second chapter of the Bible and I say, and say, well, I read that part too, and it talks about how God created uh, not only man, but he also caused man to multiply and that sort of thing. And so in chapter 2, it's about how the human process got going and so forth. God created it in the beginning, but it seems like that after that, that human life is basically a human event. Well, you could say both of those things and you would be wrong, getting the impression here that God just operated that way would be entirely incorrect. It's not what he said, it's not what he did, and it is not what he meant. God continues to take care of this world. He's still our creating and preserving Lord, and he's also the one who also sanctifies and gives us life too. So, God is not sitting around. God is doing his task, and he is working as we speak here today. In fact, God works more than any of us in all this building of put together. What he did say is that he not only is about, but he also calls us to be about. And so you heard in the gospel lesson that he collected men to go and preach for him in the New Testament time too. And so God is deeply concerned, you see, about getting the word out because without it you die. His word is the word of life. He is the Lord of life. And he calls us to share that mighty good news. There is a hymn that you might be familiar with in the hymnal too that says, Listen. Listen, God is calling, through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Jesus gave his mandate, share the good news, that he came to save us and set us free. Yeah, 833. It's powerful. Love that one. Because it talks about exactly what God's plan for us is. God's plan for us is to tell the good news of life and to respect life because it's holy and it's from Him. So we, we go to Jeremiah here and we see that God caused Jeremiah to sit up and listen to him about how he is the author of life that he designed life from head to toe, and that he knew Jeremiah before he even had a head or a toe. God knew Jeremiah before he was physically formed. God knew Jeremiah before he was conceived in his mother's womb. God knows every human being prior to our having a face and body and all of that. And he tells Jeremiah that I not only knew you, but I, being God, have mapped out your life. And your life includes that of being a prophet. I don't know that if they had a church youth group back in Jeremiah's day, but if they did, and Jeremiah was getting wind of this already, he said, I don't think so, Lord, not me. I don't think I can be a prophet. I don't, I don't know how to stand up in front of people and speak like that. I don't think I could ever do that. And that's when God says, I know the plans that I have for you to give you a future and a hope. My younger son, before he went off to Concordia, he had various Bible verses typed out and stapled, not taped, I taped, can't stapled. On our walls. And uh, we, he had Bible verses in Jeremiah uh, right here, uh, 2911 was one of them. And God strongly used that verse in his life and still does today. So how do you think that you would have reacted if God had come to you when you were a younger person, and some of you are younger yet, how would you have reacted if God said, this is a plan that I have for you. 
Well, how do you react? Because God does speak to us this morning about the plan that he has for each one of us. Your life is no accident, and there's nothing coincidental about it. Our Lord tells us that he is the author of life, and he has something very special for you to do each day that you live. And so in Jeremiah's time, he came to know this. And Jeremiah began to believe that God was going to use him in this extraordinary way, and yet he was still a bit skittish about it because he knew about the church in his day. The people were defecting from God's word, and there's a big watershed coming where there are going to be even more people turning away from God's path. And that made him a bit more fearful. And God told him that he would still use him mightily. And that he would stand in front of the people. And he would give something to the nation and the church because they were tied together back then as what we call a theocracy. We don't have a theocracy today. There are no theocracies left. God doesn't work that way. We have the church and we have the state and so forth. But, so Jeremiah was giving what amounted to basically being a state of the union kind of address, if you will. And he knew that when he stood there and he said the words that God told him to say, that there would be heat coming his way because the people would, a lot of them, would bristle at what he said. There had been other prophets before Jeremiah and they had done the same thing and some of them lost their lives because of that. These were tough people that he had to deal with. But God refused to let Jeremiah off the hook. And he said, no, my divine plan is going to stay. And I'm going to use you while you are here on this earth, but I have plans for you long after that because there's something called eternity. And so God did do that. And Jeremiah did go forth. God knew him all along, even before there was such a thing as time. So God began to gradually open up the map to his life and show him, see, now you're here, and now you're there, and so forth. And that was necessary. As God's word is disseminated, as in the Old Testament, there were prophets. We read in the Gospel lesson how Jesus collected the uh, men who you heard about in the reading here today. We can see that God is very serious about getting his word out. It is a matter of life and death that churches like this are here. That you have a pastor and that you have a community around you and there are people living and dying every day. But are they living and dying with faith in Christ? There is no bigger issue than life. Life and faith in Christ. And our Lord tells us that to reject the Word of God, and we know that some people, many people are going to do that, that God is never soft on that kind of thing. But a human being or human beings are unrepentant and unreceptive to God's word and so forth. God says, well, that's okay. We'll just, uh, it'll all come out okay in the end. We'll just sweep all that under the rug. No, God doesn't do that. God is good. God is gracious. God is also our Father. But God is also just. And he says that those who turn a deaf ear to him will be lost. That it's a major thing, the most major thing that could ever happen. He wants everyone to see their sin. And in our church, Lutheran Church, we call that, when we preach the law, people see that our lives are nowhere near what God wants, wants it to be and demands and requires it to be. And yet there is good news for those who are sorry for their offenses to God. With repentance, they hear the good news of forgiveness of all sins and life forever in heaven because of Christ. So he tells us here today, 
who speaks to us about our life and the mission that he's given us and implications that we have in revering and respecting the sanctity of life too. Life is a gift. Life is a gift. It happens when you and I were conceived and when we were born and God knew us too though before all that even took place. Before I knew you, God can say, I, I formed you and I chose you. God knows actually every person before because God is omniscient. He knows everything. You know what that means? That means that every life matters and that God has a special plan for every single person in the universe. There's nothing that is just by happen chance. And that includes the unborn. The unborn are valuable in his sight too. And that means that no life should ever be taken lightly. No life, whether it's up and around like this or still living in the womb, should ever be treated as a mistake, as an accident, as a happenstance. Even if two human beings got together and a child was conceived and so forth, and they might call a mistake, God says that every life is valuable. And so our Lord tells us that when a child is conceived, even, even in a manner that was contrary to God's word, even if it was conceived in a time of violence and so forth, that child still has an eternity. And so any attack any attack on this child is simply offensive in the sight of God. He calls snuffing that life out as murder. He calls it genocide. Human life sacrificed for what sometimes, sometimes people say is expediency. And worst of all, there are those who refuse to agree with God's plan and intentions, and they say, we're going to do what we want to do anyway, anyhow. And he tells us and shows us in the Old Testament, as well as in the time that we live in now, that there is no nation, no matter what the initials might be, if you can have a U and an S and an A in it, if you do not respect light and the sanctity that this is a holy matter from God, there will be consequences for that sin. Is there any greater offense that a nation can give than destroying life that is created by our holy God? You can pass a law and say, well, it's not okay because of Roe versus Wade. But God says, not in my book. You can have an organization that says, we plan and we parent it, and they don't do anything about planning and parenting, but only destroying life. They don't even do mammograms. All Planned Parenthood does is abort children. There will be no nation that will be excused of this. That's clearly unquestionably God's unvarnished message here. He's the author of life. And he calls us as a church, and we may be facing more difficult times as we in the church can be persecuted. If there are going to be some of your funds and my funds now going to Planned Parenthood to take the life of children, that is a challenging thing for us when we stand up for the faith. A professor of ethics gave his students a 
hypothetical problem in class one day, and he said, now listen, students, there's a man, a man and a wife, and they have kids, but the man has syphilis and his wife has tuberculosis. They already have three children, and one has died, and the three others are considered terminal because of an illness that they have, but the mother is pregnant again. What would you recommend, class, that she and the husband should do? Should she or should they proceed and deliver their unborn child or abort the child and spare this child and the family and maybe others any unpleasantries and grief and anguish in life? Well, following the spirited discussion, the majority of the class decided that it might be thus then that the mother should abort the unborn child, instead of risking all of the possibilities of a sickly child coming into the world. Then the professor turned to the class and said, fine, go ahead and abort the child. But do you know that I just described to you that you would decide then to kill Ludwig von Beethoven. That's his family I was talking about, and he was the fifth child. Can you say it for him? God gifted that baby in ways that you and I both know are extraordinary. How different the world would be without this one treasure, and there are millions and millions, of course. There have been millions and millions lost, too. More people have been aborted than have been killed in World War I, World War II, the Civil War, and Vietnam. There are 4, people, 4, 000, 4, 4 million people live in Chicago. There have been over 40 million little babies boys and girls destroy. Isn't that like over 10 cities the size of Chicago? Thankfully, Beethoven was not sacrificed, and he became a very important part of society. That was back at a time when society knew a little bit more than what they do nowadays, I think when they value life more than today. And you see, God used a new Beethoven too, before he was even born. He was a gift to his family, to the world, to the church. Jeremiah was a gift to his family, to the church. You are a gift from God to your family and your church. For those who might have gone the wrong way in life, who were told and lied to about what was really inside, and they went through the process of abortion, it is wrong in God's sight. But for anyone who is suffering from that, and with repentance turns to Christ, there is no sin for which Christ did not pay for. He paid for that too, even though it is a very serious thing. But then all serious things are serious. That's why Christ paid for all yours and mine. Our Lord says to you in closing, I set you aside for a purpose. I have holy plans for you. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand and make bold confession of our faith what we believe about our board of life? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, <coughs> suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, as we begin to pray for various people, we want to remember also Karen Schaub, who is a member here and had a procedure last Monday. We ask, Lord, that you would grant her continued healing. She is a precious life in your sight, too. We remember all the unborn today, too, Lord. And we pray that you would give, the, give wisdom to our people, uh, both on the church level and the government level, to realize the sanctity of life and the treasure, the gift that you have uh, created even from and before eternity. Grant forgiveness and grace to those who did not know this and who've gone that way and taken a life. Let them know that Christ has paid for all. Lord, in your mercy, we ask for your grace. O God, our Creator, we rejoice and give thanks for your gift of life. The heavens proclaim and the whole earth is full of your glory. Help all people everywhere to have respect and reverence for all life, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O God, our Redeemer, you confronted death to, destroy, to restore all people to your original design, to live in fellowship with you forever. Give to your whole church faithfulness to proclaim your salvation to the ends of the earth, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O God, our sanctifier, lead us to holy living, reflecting your own joyful gift of life. Enlighten our lives that we may bring the light of your salvation to those around us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Govern and direct all who are in authority of government in our land, the president, all legislators and judges, in the way that leads to the preservation of life and liberty for all. Help us to have compassion and care for all people in their needs. Lord, in your mercy, give to all who are broken in health or who face the darkness of the shadow of death your healing life-giving touch. Give them an unwavering faith in Christ's eternal promises and grant them relief from pain and anxiety. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. And Lord, we praise you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to his setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. As the Lord has sent his life-renewing word through Jonah and the prophets, be assured of his forgiveness and love. As the Lord called and sent his apostles to be fishers of men, hear his word and follow him. As we have received God's grace this day for the sake of Christ our Lord, heed his call of repentance to repentance. Rejoice in his forgiving grace and give him thanks and praise. Amen. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Oh,